and we are back live with season two of Standard Deviation. And I'm not alone, as you can see here. You are not alone. <laughs> and I want to tell you that Simo is not here as a guest, as you probably have guessed it. He is my new co-host for Standard mm -hmm. Deviation Podcast. Mm -hmm. And this is where we should... Nice. <laughs> Putting the soundboard out there right away. Exactly. Thank you for tuning in today for this first episode. Simo, you are my co-host now for Standard Deviation. For those of uh, my listeners that haven't had the chance to get on your blog or know about what you're doing, just like a short intro. Well, you know, first of all, um, it's a total honor to be here. If you recall, I'm the one who came to you begging to be added to this podcast as a co-host. So it's not you like... Uh, so it's so cool to be here. Uh, I guess if I had to say what I do in a nutshell is that I'm, I've been working in the digital marketing space for far too long now, trying to find a way out for many years, and I still haven't managed to do that. And I'm particularly obsessed with figuring out like how are how can we all be kind of developers? How can we all be engineers in this space? And I've been trying to convert people to the technical side of things, which I I think it's foreshadowing what we're going to talk about in this in this season of the podcast is how to activate that little nerd within you. I'm also a sucker for speaking about these topics, and I just love spending time just chatting about all these kinds of passions. So I'm really happy to be on this season, and I hope that we can you know make something really cool happen here. Yeah, I'm very happy that you did message me because you activated my inner nerd. So <laughs> when you messaged me, I was like, okay, this can actually be really cool, and. Uh, I'm just really excited because, as you know, I started the technical marketing blog, and it's just like a continuation of the things that I've learned in the last year. And I just want to tell the audience that are used to the format that was before where we were interviewing data analytics leaders, this season forward, we're going to focus on helping you unlock that inner nerd yes. and helping you grow your path and career towards becoming either a leader, either a freelancer or independent contributor to a company. But there's a lot of things that you should focus on and things that are probably a distraction. So I was thinking like you have somebody that is just getting started in this field, even if I've been doing digital marketing for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> but, and, but then you have Simo that has been doing this for so long and everyone that is coming up into the industry might not find the right resources at the right time or don't know exactly where to start. So I hope that everyone that's been listening so far will be even more excited to, to continue this journey with standard deviation, focused on technical marketing, activating the inner nerd and learning because learning is so important. Yeah. Like one of the really cool things that I want to explore with you is that it, it would be so easy to fall into the rut of, okay, let's spend one episode talking about SEO, one about SEN, then let's talk about analytics, tag management. Yeah. So that's an easy way out. That's teaching the actual skills. But I, I'm, I'm kind of more interested in knowing what are the kind of the surrounding, what's the context for being in this field? And there are so many different things that impact how we approach any discipline, including technical marketing, like how do we learn? How do we build communities? How do we help each other? How do we spend a good night's sleep so that we are refreshed in the morning? How do we do time management properly? So I'm a bit of a basketball fan on, on top of many other things. And there's this <laughs> Detroit Pistons point guard, Isaiah Thomas, a, a superstar of the 80s and early 90s. And, and he was asked at one point at this sidetracking a bit, but you'll learn that I do that all the time. So he was asked, like, what is the secret of basketball? And like, how do you build such an effective team? And his answer was, it's never about basketball. And so I'm going to steal that line of thinking. And when we talk about what's the secret of becoming a good marketer, it's not actually about the skills. It's not about marketing itself. It's about how our inter interpersonal relationships work, how we communicate, how we build our own kind of learning paths. All these things that I think many people think that they need to know how data analytics works. They need to know JavaScript. They need to know SQL. When in fact, they just need to activate the kind of mechanisms that help them learn these skills. And if we can figure out what those mechanisms are, that's what I think when we've struck gold and also puts us apart from our competitors in this podcasting space, because they're all still talking about the skills and we can now talk about the context. I'm all for context. I only talk about context. <laughs> I guess ever since I, I moved to this field, I just feel like, 
all the things that I've learned in marketing and business make more sense than all my technical skills. For the last year, I took so many courses, like I lost track of how many <laughs> courses I've taken, SQL, Python, R, just the introduction yeah. stuff. And they're good because I can read the data layer. I can read yeah. custom HTML tag. But at the same time, it's like, what are we doing this for? What is the business trying to achieve? How are we mapping all these technical skills and tools with the mindset of the business? Like, what's the progress? And I remember when I had you as a guest in, in the first season, you said something that people tend to realize that they're taught the processes to tools and technology. Mm -hmm. And this is where you become like super narrow in your view and you don't think about anything else. But Simon, tell me, I know that I learned about technical marketing from you, but where did you first encounter this, I guess, concept, this layer of, of technical marketing? I'm certainly not going to claim that I was in any way the first person to use that, but for me, it was a counter reaction. I'm one of those really annoying music fans that when I find a band, I'm super proud that I found them. But then when they become popular, I'm like, oh man, that's so lame. I do that all the time and I'm really ashamed of it because I've lost interest in many good bads because of that. But the same thing I think comes with technical marketing in that I found that so many products and platforms were being pitched with this notion of a non-technical marketer. So if you just Googled, you found like, this is a great way for non-technical marketers to do tagging. This is a great platform for non-technical marketers to do SEO crawling. And I always found that really funny and ironic because we're working in digital marketing, like literally the word digital is in there in the name. And we're working in an inherently technical medium and anything we do has to do with the internet. And if you think about skills that don't sound like they have anything to do with technical marketing, like copywriting, you're still, you still have to figure out like screen resolutions, header alignment, font kerning, what, how different types of screens present your content. So. Just this idea, why are some people celebrating this negative and they're proud to be non-technical marketers when in fact they can't be by definition because they're working in digital marketing. So that's when I wrote this kind of a ranty blog post where I called this behavior off and said that why, why instead of celebrating that you're a non-technical marketer, why not explore all the possibilities of what technical marketing enables you to do? And I still don't think that it's a specific kind of movement or anything else. It's just a handy way of categorizing the type of digital marketing that has to do with programming, with, with different types of markup languages, meta languages that has to do with using tools in a more technical way. And it's just a way of categorizing things. I think it separates the certain type of marketer from the non-technical kind where you're not afraid of code, where you're not afraid of learning technical things. And to celebrate the fact that I am working in the internet, I'm working and I'm understanding how these things work. So I think that's been a huge focus, especially since we created Simmer a couple of years ago, just helping people. We talked about activation, helping people activate that understanding that it's not difficult. It's time consuming, but it's not difficult and it's something to celebrate in my view, at least. I don't know what your thoughts are. You just wrote the technical marketing guide and you obviously explored this dynamic. So what did you think? Why did you do that? I found your article that you wrote out of some time back and I was reading through it. And I think when I was at CXO and Pep told me, Juliana, you're great, but you need more technical skills. And I'm like, I do. <laughs> and I actually attributed to Pep. He said, just go do this technical marketing mini degree. Simo did it. You'll like it. And... Pep didn't know probably that's going to make me leave the company <laughs> in the end. But I went through the technical marketing mini degree and the structure of it. And it just makes sense. And as you said, these are the building blocks of the internet. And mm. if you're working on, on the internet with internet businesses, you have to understand how the internet works. And I feel like a lot of us that called them, I used to call myself non-technical too before. And I was wrong because I was technical mm. without Exactly. You can be super technical or technical adjacent to how Doug names it without even knowing or putting a label to it. But I think we as marketers, because I'm a marketer, I think we are faster to put the non-tech label on ourselves versus the technical one, because the technical one would make us look different from the other crowd of marketers that are all very demand gen and content and whatever. But the problem is that if you continue like that, you're not able to join those conversations. And I feel like the way the industry is moving right now, it's, it's impossible to survive without knowing how things work. It's, it it's, is. That's why I wrote that article and I tried to break down all the things that I had to learn and unlearn. I don't, I don't think I know them perfectly. 
But I, if I'm put into a conversation, I will know how to engage in that conversation. And I think that's how it started for me, with just being able to join the conversation and not having, I guess, that chip on my shoulder that I don't know what's being talked about. And I also see this differentiation in the market between digital marketing and product analytics that's mm-hmm. happening. And I see that the product analytics pile is getting bigger and bigger. And mostly I see companies interested in customer experience and customer journey and activation, as you said. And if you want to be in that category, you need to understand how the internet works, how the websites work, what is a customer journey, what's a DOM. Like if you want to track everything, (laughs) how if you cannot read the DOM and understand what's an element attribute, you won't be able to track. Yes. like that but because it's january and everyone probably already failed their resolutions by now i didn't start the gym i still have pink hair and i said i was gonna give up on my pink hair but it's still here but i guess we can create some sort of resolutions for where we want to take this podcast i also want to ask you before we get there i'm gonna drop something for you right now there you go before we talk about resolutions Oh, yes, this dirty disco beat reminds me of my youth in the 70s when I wasn't born yet. So I want to, paced by this lovely music, I want to share a few words about Simmer because we are, whether you like it or not, we are the sponsors of this podcast and we enable this wonderful audio quality, for example. So at Simmer, we believe that curiosity is something that should be nurtured and nourished. So that's one of the reasons why we found this podcast so easy to easy to help out on. And we do this at Simmer by offering these kinds of affordable but still self-paced online courses around topics that we feel are relevant in the world of technical digital marketing. So it's a completely arbitrary decision what becomes a course, but it's been quite fun thus far just creating that content. And when you enroll in one of our courses, you get lifetime access to the content, and which I always thought was a pretty cool offer. And in addition... So you can find us at teamsimmer.com, but you can always use the coupon code DEVIATE, so that's D-E-V-I-A-T-E, to get 10% off an individual course purchase. So that's teamsimmer.com and the coupon code is DEVIATE. And we'll have these little advertisements every now and then in this pod- podcast, but I will change the beat around a bit. But the disco beat is really nice. Can we have it back on actually? Yes, there we go. I was ready. <laughs> You will find the links for Simmer and the discount code in the episode footnotes. Or if you're watching this on YouTube and seeing Simmer dance, you'll find it in the (laughs) video description. Cool. So, Simmer, let's talk about these New Year resolutions. I've been. How was your New Year? What did you do? Oh, I slept through it. Well done. (laughs) I'm the worst. That's a parent talking. Yes. So I was with my son in his room. The baby was sleeping. He was with my husband. And I was with my son. It was 11.45. There was no fireworks. Like, we were just Mm -hmm. waiting for the fireworks to start outside. And in Romania, as a normal Romanian, you would start the fireworks from 11. But no, this time there was nothing. So me and my son just gave up. We we played Uno the whole time. We're just waiting. So we gave up around, I think it was 11.50. And and then they started. And I remember I was with my son. And I asked him, do you want to watch the fire? He was like, nah, let's sleep. <laughs> so we just basically fell asleep. I know it sounds crazy, but when you have kids, it's not that fun, I guess. But I think it was good for me because I spent New Year's with who I wanted to spend it with. Exactly. And it was a good memory because the next day he was like, yes, yeah, see, challenge accepted. I slept <laughs> through it. Yeah, yes. that's that. I know it's not fun, but that's exactly what I did. How yeah. about you? We were actually in Tallinn. We took the ferry to Estonia. I spent the night in Tallinn with our family and with friends as well. And yeah, I can't remember the last time I've actually been awake at midnight for New Year. <laughs> so we yeah, so we were we spent the night in a hotel room playing, just talking, and just our kids were watching the TV. They got to stay up a bit later, but yeah, we yeah. definitely fell asleep before before midnight, <laughs> which is fine because Tallinn the official fireworks were canceled because the weather was really bad. That it was so windy, but they. Oh, no. It, there was this huge battery of fireworks just outside our hotel room window at around when we were all trying to get some sleep and the kids had already fallen asleep, which is still weird because our kids slept through that. And it was like, like somebody was bombing the apartment, but my wife and I, of course, we just woke up in immediately. So that kind of sucked, but let the others have their fun. We're already grown parents. Family. It's over. Yeah, exactly. It's over for us. <laughs> But it's true. I mean, yeah, it's nice to have the dinner and talk. But I think at some point, again, I think it's an age thing. You just like, it's just whatever. Yeah. And you'll get it back when your kids are old enough. You'll Because they'll want to stay up as well and they'll want to see the fireworks. So then you'll get to relive that. But I think yeah, when you have young kids, it's 
it is what it is. They decide how your life works and, and that's quite fine. <laughs> but talking from a technical marketing perspective, what are some like New Year's resolution for you with technical marketing? Because I feel, and maybe I'm partly to blame for this, but I feel like it's catching on more. And I see a lot of people being interested in the topic and taking courses. And I get people messaging me, unfortunately, good or bad messages, but I get people messaging me all the time and asking me, like, what should I learn next? What should I do? What should I, how should I approach it? And I see a wave of people moving from digital marketing to technical roles, to product management, to product analytics. Data engineering, yeah. The engineering, exactly. We just have a colleague right now at work that used to be an art professor. (laughs) <laughs> and she learned Python and R, and now she joined as a data analyst. And yeah, I was like, that's really cool. Wow. <laughs> that's really <laughs> you know? cool. So what are your thoughts? It's becoming mainstream. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, my actual New Year's resolutions, the little that I did them have nothing to do with my professional life. So they were like, one of them is that I have to learn, I think I put the limit at 100 names of Pokemon <laughs> so that I can have fluent discussion with my son and just relax more and stress less. But like for me, the focus for the last years has been just becoming a better developer, I think, in general, like understanding the development ec- ecosystem, not just about learning to code better, which is obviously a, an important part of it, but how to build pro- projects, how to build products, how to engineer kind of product development work. And I think that w- one of the important streams, which I think is becoming more and more relevant to marketers, regardless of what they're going to focus on, is just understanding the cloud better and understanding the possibilities of an almost infinitely scalable cloud infrastructure. And because that applies to almost anything, like you, you, can, you can build applications, which is a traditional way of approaching the cloud, but you can also build data pipelines. You can build simple visualizations. You can use BigQuery to do analysis. You can build data warehouses. There's so much you can do on the cloud that I think that if people are right now struggling, what should we do next? I have all these options then taking the umbrella of what cloud enables is a very good starting point and then starting building your learning paths from that because the future is definitely in scalable computing, in machine learning, in in things like that, and especially in analytics. So I think understanding those, you talked about it, it's important to be able to join the conversations and cloud is one of those things. It has a million different components and it would be impossible for you to learn about all of them. But just to understand the basic building blocks and being able to join conversations around virtual machines and scalability and things like that is, I think, is becoming more and more important. So for me, it's a constant learning journey. My, my goals haven't changed at all for the last four or five years. It's just to figure out even better this weird hybrid of engineering and marketing and people skills that I'm trying to juggle with. <clears throat> I totally agree with the cloud. I'm going through through a training right now. What else is it? T- Juliana's taking a course. <laughs> but I'm going through a very intense training. It's called Google Cloud Leader. And this is a Google a Google Cloud uh, training. Is that on Coursera or? It's actually for free. They're giving it for free on Cloud Skill Boost. Okay. But it has nothing to do with the exam. So Google says in their marketing page, yes, take all these courses, get the badges. And this is going to be in the exam. No. They're not in the exam. You have to learn totally different things. And I will share in the footnotes, if you're interested in the Cloud Digital Leader, there's a free code camp course on YouTube. Six hours, but it's worth it. And that's exactly what's in the exam. But I'm seeing the value of cloud when it comes to qualitative data a lot, a lot, because people have tons of reviews. Like, for instance, if you're selling on Amazon, you have tons of reviews from different people. And instead of trying to do all of that analysis in a Google sheet, you could use natural language processing, write a nice app script and have everything there. You can still use Google Sheets, but at least it's faster if you upload 5,000 reviews. And then you can use things like natural language processing, or you can use Vertex AI. I actually like Vertex AI. There's so many things you can do. I saw Julian the other day. He used the app engine to do this little app that changes the temperature. Yeah, I was like, that's so crazy. Like, it's so easy to do anything right now. So I agree. I agree. Cloud is becoming very important to learn, but you shouldn't know everything or you shouldn't Mm. have to know how to code an app, but you should understand like how it works, how it, how can it benefit the business? What are the things that you have? What are the options? And I think AWS, Google and Azure, everyone is doing a great job pushing this into the mainstream. So you have where to choose from. You just need to understand how it works. And I do like the BigQuery option. And I like that people are starting to talk about that and take that into consideration Mm -hmm. more. 
it's difficult to get there. Of course, it's not as easy as everyone is trying to make it look like. So you should probably take some courses for that. Well, it's moved away from the it's moved away from the the original premise of renting machines and externalizing your computation, and it's really more about the serverless processes now because you can just delegate a single thing, a single function, a single timer to the cloud, and just have it run every and then and then and then seconds, for example. And that's and I think that's where the cool stuff is. And if you're looking at things like the biggest trend of this year is definitely going to be people just spamming these chat GPT articles. And now there's going to be a new version coming out, which is like a zillion times better than version three. And so we're just going to have even more of those. That's all about computing. That's all about taking like a crap load of source data and training data and then applying algorithms on that. And that wouldn't be possible without a scalable infrastructure in, in it. It's not like it's running in the closet on a machine running in your closet or something. It's actually out there virtually. So just understanding that you can delegate all these processes. And when you learn about the cloud, you start looking at, okay, what am I doing right now that's taking an unbelievably long amount of time me manually doing it every day. And I have a lot of that stuff because there's a lot of overhead in running a e-commerce business. So whenever I see that, okay, I'm spending 12 minutes every day on this particular task, I start immediately thinking, okay, how long will it take for me to function. turn that into a cloud function that runs every day at the same time, for example. And that I don't have to know exactly how to do it. I just need to know that's a possibility. It's a possibility. Yeah, yeah. So that's the activation thing again. I have activated within me a new kind of thought process, which goes... Am I spending too much time on this? If yes, then move it to the cloud. And then I can start Googling, okay, how do I update a WooCommerce API? How do I get the orders? And how do I push them into a Google Sheet using the cloud? And then there are a million different options for that. I think it would be actually really cool this season to have a talk about cloud engineering, just on a kind of a high level. And, I, and there are certain people that we need to talk about that. So let's put that on the backlog as well. I <laughs> would love that. Planned. I would love that because I am just learning this stuff. Yeah. And this is like probably one of the things that people that move from a non-technical to a technical yeah. role, you will be in a candy shop every day. Yeah. And if you are curious and have a bit of ADHD like me, everything is going to excite you. Yeah. Everything. I'm excited about everything. Yeah. I opened the Looker, the actual Looker, not Looker Studio. A month ago, I lost my shit. I was like, whoa. Oh, yeah. you can put That's different sure. models of data. Oh, then you can visualize this. This is better than MetaBase because I used to use MetaBase. I'm yeah. like, oh, this is so cool. And then you get into Google Cloud and, and I'm obsessed with natural language processing, but that's because I'm a marketer. Yeah. <laughs> and there's so many things that people do in companies, big or small, that are time consuming. And this is not about this conversation of AI or machine learning replacing people. It's about people being able to know what's possible mm. and use these things to help their jobs. For sure. And, uh, you shouldn't use chat GPT to write your blog post. You should use chat GPT probably for research yeah. or you should use it to find more about a, a specific topic. So I'm excited about cloud in general. I'm excited about machine learning. And I, I think it's a great moment, like everything that's going on in the analytics and marketing world with privacy, with new tools and tool war games, and all the stuff that's happening on social media. I think it's a great time for people to just like stop and really define, okay, my business is structured to make money like this. Like in your case, you're selling courses. And I know that business model very well. Like you are, this is how you're structured to make money. You're selling either a bundle or individual courses. Okay, but what are my internal processes? What are my external processes? How am I allocating resources? Like these are things that people should talk before they jump into tools and deciding, oh, should I just plug GA4? Should I plug Matomo? Mm -hmm. Should I do this? It doesn't really matter what you're using as long as what you're using fits with your business. Yeah. So it's a great time, in my opinion, for people to use critical thinking, not just to do feature differentiation. Yeah. But just look at their own business and how it's running and how they can help that business progress. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Actually, we could share a million different anecdotes about ChatGPT, but I had just a very specific example that really blew my mind is that I asked ChatGPT, so this was after we already released the JavaScript for Digital Marketers mm -hmm. course on Simmer, and I asked ChatGPT to design a curriculum for JavaScript for Digital Marketers online course. And it gave me a table of contents that was remarkably similar to the one that I created. So I was validated. I was like, wow, this came 
just out of nowhere, I just decided this is a good curriculum. And then we have this algorithm that tells me that it was actually a good idea. So I'm seriously considering externalizing a lot of the kind of initial thought coming up with ideas, coming up yeah. with course. Once I have the idea, I can just feed it to those algorithms and have them give me a structured list of things to expand. Because I think for that, it works really nicely just as an idea generation machine. Exactly. Like you can find so many things that are interesting and worth exploring. And with the curriculum, I did a similar thing with how I structure my blog, the technical marketer guide. And I was like, whoa, it was similar. But I don't like that Microsoft is buying it, though. Yeah, I really don't like that. I'm very triggered. When I saw I was like, oh, yeah. OK. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not a fan of Microsoft since I tested Microsoft Clarity once. And yeah. I felt naked. It was 20 minutes only. And I saw everything on the website. Like they, that's the worst privacy solution to yeah. use. And ever since I had that experience, I was like, no, my Yeah, they added a lot of weird tracking directly out it's of the crazy. box. So you had to kind of opt out of that, which was really annoying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I want to ask, I'm trying to really see. So that nobody hears. Nobody can hear. But I have this good microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk about what people can expect from the season of uh, standard deviation. And again, I'm so happy that you're here. I feel it's going to be really fun to be able to go through all this, uh, this parts of this uh, career. And I, I guess for me and what I want to, what I want us to do is to be able to help that new analyst mm -hmm. that comes in the industry, that new digital marketer that comes in the industry, or even people that are tr like, because of so many layoffs that happen, I see people yeah. transitioning a lot. And it's remarkable for me to see very crazy changes. Oh, I was doing this and then I'm doing this and I'm the living version of that too. But my transition is not that crazy. But what are your expectations from this season of Standard Deviation podcast? What are you hoping that we can achieve by the end of the season? Apart from the obvious of having interesting guests and and cool topical things to talk about, I just really want to explore that activation mechanism. I, I want to figure out like how do we find the types of topics that might not be as obvious, but are still extremely relevant to helping people become better professionals in this industry. And one of one of the things that I want to talk about because it's such an important thing for me is just time management. Yeah. We we're both like pathological multitaskers. We have so many things going on and I've never managed to formalize that. So I know that there are other people in the industry who are even let me say even worse than we are in this aspect. So I'd love to put our heads together and figure out like how we have all these different responsibilities. How do we assign priorities? How do we figure out what should we focus on next? For an engineer or a developer, one of the most important concepts is how are you in the zone? So when you're in the zone, you can just do stuff and nothing around you bothers you. So how do we find those techniques to be in the zone? That's one of the topics. There's so much cool stuff in marketing right now. And I'm just trying to figure out like what would be the dream team of people and dream team of topics. And we have a really good season coming up for that. And there's going to be a lot of people I've always wanted to talk to and we're going to have them on the show. That's awesome. Like Barack Obama and Exactly. And Beyonce. Yeah, and, for uh, sure. We'll have to bump her to season three because there are more <laughs> interesting people, of course, but... We're getting Swirlik from Metallica as well. Yeah, that would be cool. That would be I have some words to Lars about Metallica in the 90s, but we can certainly leave that. Oh, home. man. I miss Metallica in the 80s, though. Wow. Yeah. That would be a, we should talk about Metallica. The, the, <laughs> so. new sing, the new single isn't bad. It's a, it's a return to form for them, I think, in many ways. I'm afraid to check it out, to yeah, be honest. It's like, good. lately, I've been trying to not destroy my image of perfection, but I prefer Metallica in the 80s. With, yeah, for um, sure. The yeah. first four albums are like backs of the genre, so. Exactly, yeah. So I'm trying not to. But uh, yeah, as you are very specific with things like when they become mainstream, you don't like them. I'm also very specific and with good things that I like, and I don't want to watch something else because I might not like it. Oh, yeah. So I don't want to. Yeah, I'm very weird with music, <laughs> with music yeah. like that. I'm also very excited for this season because I feel like activation is the missing link mm. in uh, in analytics and in marketing because everyone is planning you know to track different things they're planning to look at different kpis but nobody's talking and thinking about the outcome so i was uh, presenting at measure camp stockholm last year and my topic was about measurement planning okay we're planning these kpis we're asking ourselves questions we're setting up tags in google tag manager and we have these metrics that we're looking at Great. But what are we doing next? 
what what are you doing with this data? Yep. Nobody's planning. So instead of just saying, oh, I want to know my COV, it's like for me, it's my curse, but I want to know my COV. Okay, great. And what are you going to do if your COV is bad? And what are you going to do if your COV is good? Like you have to have some sort of continuity, but people don't plan for this stuff. And I really think that data it should have a roadmap. Yep. Just as a product inside the company, there has to be somebody that makes sure that data becomes more purposeful, more ethical, I guess, more compliant, mm-hmm. but also serves the business in a way. And there's a connection between that roadmap of data and the company strategy, growth strategy. Like you cannot yep. make progress unless those things meet somewhere in the middle. And I would challenge people that if they have product managers in the team that are taking care of a product, they should also have a data manager in the team or whatever we're going to call that person to be able to take care of data and make sure it's, I'm using this word a lot lately, purposeful, because it has to have a purpose. So I'm very excited about that. But I'm also excited for the people that are just coming yeah. into this industry. I, I can offer them a lot of cynicism and a lot of me stuff. Help me get out of this industry. And you can reel me in and say that there are still cool things here. There's still cool things. Yeah, exactly. yeah. That's right. Like a yeah. very cool thing that I want to share with people is that I learned how to write technical documentation. And oh, it was nice. really fun. It's, I thought I messed it up very bad. Yeah. Julian gave me feedback and then I actually made it better. And I really like the fact that it's a logical thinking, right? I was thinking like, why am I so afraid of doing this? That, that's a good that's a good company to be in. If you have people who keep, who not only hold you accountable, but are also supporting you. Yeah. Th- that's what's missing if you go as an entrepreneur. Your main feedback comes from your customers and maybe from the community. And they hold you accountable in a very different way. Like of there's course. a lot of entitlement because they're paying you or they're following you. Yeah. So you mm-hmm. feel mm-hmm. like you, you owe them something, but it's a good, it's a good kind of pressure as well, but it's very different from having a friend in the trenches with you who's fighting the same battles as you kind of working towards the same goals as you. So having people like Julian and Doug around you. They're is- very nice. Yeah. And have a lot of patience. And uh, I see that with throughout the whole team. And there's many companies like that, that have patience. Yeah. I'm very excited for this season. I'm very happy that it's with you. And I'm very happy to have Simmer as, as a sponsor. And before we let people build excitement for the next episode that we will release, I want to ask you, like, what's something that you read in the last period that you would like to share with with people? Yeah, I'm going to give a shout out to one one of my absolute best friends in the industry and my old former colleague. And so Mark Edmondson, who just a while ago left employment at IH Nordic, which is a great company from Denmark, he's written a, a book, if not even the book on Google Analytics called Learning Google Analytics creating business impact and driving insights. I wonder how much he had say in picking that title. (laughs) But yeah, you can get it on Amazon right now. I have the book. I purchased it. I've skinned through it. I've tried to find all the references to me. So thank you, Mark, for mentioning me a number of times. That's the egoist in me talking. Very good around a very complicated topic, which is Google's analytics platforms. But the approach is really sound. It it approaches it from a more like a, a data management, data engineering point of view than just looking at this is what GA does and this is how GA works. So I really recommend people pick up that book, use your company budget to buy a bunch of copies for you because that will also make Mark uh, richer with the meager royalties O'Reilly is willing to give him. That's awesome. I've met him in Copenhagen and he said something that is going to stick with me forever. He said, real-time dashboards need a real-time person that takes real-time decisions. Otherwise, it's useless. I was like, oh my God, you're right. You're right. So yeah, he's great. I actually retweeted him and hoping to win. So everyone make sure you go and buy Mark's book and also check the link in the description of the video or in the podcast notes and buy his book on Amazon. And I think that's it, Simo, is it? I think so. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on this podcast. Uh, in a good way, it feels like I'm just a guest, but I'm super excited that I'm not just a guest, that I'm just going to stick here like a bad penny and I'll just keep turning up. <laughs> And you won't be able to get rid of me, at least for this year, which is pretty cool. I'm, you're Yay. contractually obligated to have me on, even though we never <laughs> signed a contract, which is pretty cool. But um, yeah, I'm super excited for this season. We have some really awesome episodes coming up. Hopefully something refreshing, hopefully something new. And I hope we'll keep our banter as insubordinate and random and chaotic as we've managed to do it in this episode. So what can I say? Thanks up for this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just so people take care, tune in for the next episode. and. Um, Keep deviating.
Oh, exactly. That was yeah. horrible. Yeah, let's. We're not going to cut that out, but that was absolutely horrible. We'll come up with a better sign off, some <laughs> phrase for the it's next. It's okay. I will end with the dirty disco. <laughs> oh yeah, that's good. That's good. That's it. That's good. See you guys that's next time. Sunset.